to the Berlin Process Think Tank and Civil Society Forum, which we broadcast to your life, as it were, uh, from Sofia. We were hoping to do this event with all of you here, uh, but in this uh, very strange times, unfortunately, this is impossible. Um, we are still, um, I think, uh, a very strong team because we are at least three teams put in one. Um, we have the European Council on Foreign Relations and its, Bul its Bulgarian office, the European Fund for the Balkans and its Belgrade headquarters, and the Institute for Democracy in Skopje, our partners uh, in this, with whom we did the first leg or the first part of this meeting, um, when was it, mid-March, right before <laughs> um, everything closed down. And back then in Skopje, we thought it is really a, a great opportunity for us, the think tanks in the region, to uh, first of all, bridge the distinction between, um, between member states and, and non-member states in the Balkans, because we are obviously a, a one very integrated region, but also uh, to get um, the think tanks and the civil society from the Western Balkans talk uh, from the region uh, to the leaders of the Berlin process. Um, I am very happy that this is still happening, uh, despite of the fact that the ministerial and also the summit are happening online. Uh, we, we still um, succeeded to keep, kind of, to, to stick to our plans and to make this meeting possible. Uh, we are, we have invited a lot of our colleagues over Zoom and we are screening this uh, session also online on YouTube. So welcome to uh, everybody who, who is watching us as well. This uh, initial panel is supposed to, to give us uh, kind of the framework of the discussion, and I will leave this to my friends Alexandra and Marco to do that. I just want to say that uh, the main benefit for me from this, uh, from this event is the opportunity to be able to really prove that uh, there are a lot of uh, very interesting, very smart people in the region who have great ideas, uh, and uh, we can use really this opportunity to push them and to, uh, and to demonstrate them uh, in front of the policy makers. Uh, this is why I'm also very happy that Minister Zakharieva and Mi Minister Osmani, uh, the foreign ministers of Bulgaria and North Macedonia are here with us, uh, and uh, they will have the floor in a moment. Without further ado, Alexandra, over to you. Thank you very much, Vesela. Uh, thank you very much, and welcome everybody to the 2020 edition, like all the 2020 editions, obviously, it's online and Zoom. Um, I would like to uh, thank you on behalf of the European Fund for the Balkans, um, especially uh, responsible for today's part of the Civil Society Forum, which started back in 2015 with its Vienna edition, and then uh, it became an integral part of the Berlin process. Um, last year, under the Polish presidency, a new format has been introduced, the Think Tank Forum, which shows that in our region we have developed a number of high-quality think tanks that they deserve their own forum and platform. And today I'm really happy that we managed to integrate both of them. We will have one rather geopolitical view and then we will have another view um, which will show how it looks like when geopolitics becomes personal. And in our region it's becoming very personal. Um, the capitals of our regions are figuring very prom prominently on the global top 10 lists when it comes to pollution. And uh, this is only one thing, we will hear more about that in the second panel. Um, when Bulgaria and North Macedonia took over one and a half years ago the presidency of the Berlin process, everybody was so full of hope and it was such a different moment in history than what we see now. In the last one and a half years we had a lot of strokes, we survived them all, 
But uh, I think that uh, maybe also today is a day when we can ask ourselves, will enlargement and will our region uh, survive the next stroke or will we face the situation enlargement is dead, long live enlargement. Um, we will discuss the outside actor today um, and maybe that is only one part of the picture that shows an alternative that uh, we could all live if we really bury enlargement. Um, but I will not be too pessimistic. I will stop here. Um, thank you very much again. Welcome and Marco, over to you. Okay, thank you, Alexandra, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, I would like to congratulate our partner, CFR Vessel and her team, as well as Alexandra and EFB for making this event possible in all uh, COVID-19 challenges that, that, that we face. Distinguished ministers, think tankers, civil society representatives, dear participants, uh, we opened this think tank forum and the civil society forum with one eye on the prospects for renewed partnership over the Atlantic and with other eye on the EU strategic autonomy uh, in the INO. Ambitious uh, global commissions and uh, commission and the Green Deal are challenged by the recovery plans for EU economy restoration set for 2022, while China is galloping away from the grip of COVID-19 towards global economic dominance in 2035. Uh, dear guests, uh, climate and pollution is changing for worse. This weekend, Macedonian government decided to shut down all the hydropower plants due to critical minimum of water levels in all accumulations. We are not doing any good in changing our economy uh, on green basis. The Western Balkan accounts for 45 million tons of CO2 emissions annually, and all 16 coal plants in the Western Balkan pollute as much as the entire EU fleet of 250 units. If I was coming also from Skopje to this event by car, it would take me four hours to reach Sofia since there is no highway, no real uh, railway connection until now. The journey would take me through many ghost towns and villages while UN projects depopulation of 25 to 50 percent in Central and Southeastern Europe by the end of this century. The future of EU and Western Balkans are intertwined by these challenges. Environment, economic convergence, migration, security, hybrid threats, rule of law, and geopolitical investment, something we will discuss uh, soon. But they all must be tackled together and with a common approach. Yes, it is evident we have to speed up the common regional market and the infrastructural connections and build greener economies. But uh, not to do this, the imperative is not to do this with corrosive geopolitical capital. This capital weakens resilience and enhances malign political influences. I would like to use this opportunity to appeal to Western Balkan officials to stop the race to the bottom. And I'm we commit to competitive uh, to have regional public prosecutor office with investigative offices that will tackle regional organized crime. At the last think tank forum in Skopje in March, we gathered 18 countries and 80 think tankers to signal the importance of political dialogue and cooperation within the region and the region within EU under a united narrative and shared future. Soon you will be able to, to see the link of the edited volume of all publications we produce based on the panels and the discussions on, on this forum in the chat box uh, of, of, this, of the Zoom platform. For the first time, the Berlin process is hosted by two countries, one a new member and the other a candidate state. We were granted ownership on the very process that aims to assist us towards full integration with EU. Will we prove worthy to the task and what we achieved? The question is, is it another brick in the bridge or another brick in the wall? I would stop here with these questions and would uh, like to thank all of you for, for coming here, virtually, of course. Thank you very much, Marco, with this uh, Pink Floyd uh, style ending. 
I think uh, we can turn to to the ministers, uh, and maybe I just get it, uh, give the, the mic straight back to you. You want to quiz them a little bit before yeah. we enter uh, our work. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you, Vesela. Uh, uh, again, thanks for the Minister uh, Zakaria, my Minister Osmani, for accepting the invitation uh, to open the discussion, to set the scene to this uh, Think Tank Forum and the Civil Society Forum. We have around 20 minutes to discuss the goals of the Berlin Process Summit in Sofia. And without any further ado, I would moderate this occasion by asking around maybe three questions. Please account for around three to four minutes per question for for your answers. And I would start with uh, Minister Zaharieva. Uh, you just co-chaired the ministerial meeting this morning in light of the summit tomorrow. And we are finalizing the first Balkan co-presidency with the Berlin process. So what is our legacy, Minister Zaharieva? What will make Berlin process and this co-presidency to be remembered for? Hello to everybody. Uh, allow me to start with uh, gratitude. Uh, first to Vesso, of course, uh, who was uh, agreed uh, to be a Sofia coordinator for the think tank in civil society forum. And of course, Marco and Alexandra that, uh, who joined her. And um, unfortunately, as Vesso was said, it was planned to be physical uh, it was planned, we are to be together with me today and we to co-chair from Sofia, but unfortunately I am in my home and um, he is in Skopje. Uh, but uh, this is the year of COVID and um, uh, we should learn to live with it. Um, it was a very concrete question and thank you for, 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 for this. Uh, I think that um, uh, the two uh, major achievements uh, despite the fact that it was uh, we should uh, really change uh, uh, the whole program uh, that was planned uh, in march actually the last um, there was one physical meeting it's uh, maybe alexander said that everything was virtual but it was one and it was foreign ministers meeting in scopion 10th of um, uh, march this year uh, I was uh, together with uh, Boyar's predecessor, Nicola, and with some of the European uh, and some of the other ministers. And uh, today's uh, ministerial meeting uh, was built on what we uh, start in Skopje on 10th of March. And the focus today, actually, and I'm happy that the focus today was uh, youth and the role of civil society in the Berlin process. And uh, we adopt very concrete conclusions of the uh, co-chairs, uh, I mean, um, uh, me and Buyar, that will be incorporate, incorporated in the uh, leaders' uh, conclusions uh, tomorrow. But I think that the most um, um, important and visible achievement of um, our co-chairmanship uh, 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 will be first signing uh, tomorrow of the uh, declaration of the, um, uh, the regional market in the Western Balkans, uh, which should prepare the countries uh, for the European single market. And it's extremely important, especially now uh, in uh, COVID uh, era uh, pandemic. And second is uh, decoration on the green agenda for the West Western Balkans that will reconfirm the commitments of the countries to align themselves with the ambitious action plan envisaged under the European Green Deal. Uh, I think those are the most visible, uh, the most visible things. Unfortunately, the plan, the plan was to have a physical youth forum in July in Skopje. It was not possible uh, because of the pandemic. But uh, we included uh, the youth organization in the meeting of the ministers of our economy focused on decent job creation and uh, stop of brain drain. Uh, so <laughs> we wasn't able to meet us physically, but I think the achievements of the first ever double co-chairmanship uh, 
and first ever chairmanship uh, of the countries from the region. As you said, Marco, one European member states, the other candidate. Uh, I think we managed to uh, to achieve a very good result for our presidency, co-chairmanship, not presidency. Uh, thank you, Minister Zakaria, Minister Osmani. What's your take on this question? What would you emphasize? What do you will tell your kids in the future? What did we achieve? Well, first of all, thank you, Marco. Uh, for inviting me to participate in this uh, uh, panel. I believe that uh, the role of Berlin process uh, throughout these six years uh, of its existence was to foster regional cooperation and to accelerate uh, EU integration. But uh, I think that the current model of joint uh, chairmanship between candidate country from the region and a neighboring EU member state uh, signifies uh, regional ownership and stewardship of our regional affairs and, uh, and interests. And I think this bears the, 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 the symbolic, but uh, also I think it will be remembered as a regional brand of success for its uh, result-oriented uh, approach, but as well uh, working and succeeding in a very dire circumstances, very difficult uh, circumstances and challenges. The presidency has set an ambitious agenda that was unfortunately heavily affected by the pandemics, but uh, we managed to, to regroup, to adapt to the uh, circumstances and to produce a significant list of achievements that if are going to be endorsed tomorrow by the leaders, I think will uh, mark this summit as a real uh, success. And one of the outstanding achievement of uh, this uh, process would be the revised action plan on common region, which uh, will uh, enable uh, creating a regional market of 18 million uh, people based on EU rules and procedure, procedures with an aim to uh, get, uh, bringing it closer to the EU single market, but as well to, to, to increase its competitiveness and attractiveness to uh, foreign uh, invet investors. And uh, also an important moment uh, in this action plan is the incorporation of the four freedoms that were part of the so-called mini Schengen initiative, which sort of creates a bridge and complementarity between the regional initiatives by that increasing their uh, efficiency. We sh should also uh, not underestimate the role of the agreement on free movement with ID cards between the uh, countries in the Western Balkan that in addition to other initiatives in the first map area as rec recognition of the degrees would would have an additional impetus on free movement of, of people on 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 the youth in the in the region uh, the enhanced uh, i would uh, also mention the enhanced roma declaration that's an initiative that uh, we have uh, proposed uh, or we proposed last year in poznan and it was uh, further reaffirmed in the tirana uh, conference so this uh, uh, Tirana conference this uh, year, but as well the green agenda and its importance uh, and its importance now. So uh, overall, uh, I think it uh, hopefully tomorrow is going to be uh, a successful uh, summit that will pave the way for uh, future uh, regional ownership of this uh, uh, of this process as well with uh, uh, marked. Uh, as results, uh, concrete results uh, for, for, for pe in people's life. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Osmani. Uh, now we envisaged uh, this next uh, two panels uh, uh, to be uh, to be focused on uh, on uh, geopolitical investments, on the threats that uh, foreign capital poses to the cooperation of the region, but it also emanates. Uh, uh, on the uh, has implications on the on the EU as well, uh, definitely. So, um, uh, Mr. Zakharieva, how do you see 
2021 in terms of enlargement process as a resilience mechanism for protection of the geopolitical interests of the EU. Uh, to put it more particular, concretely, how can the region prepare and fight better against geopolitical investments and malign influences? Uh, like build resilience in their societies. Uh, and um, this is the shortest answer that I can give. Uh, I think, uh, and that's why the building process is so important initiative. It's uh, planned uh, for five years to prepare the countries for eventual membership of European mm -hmm. Union. Uh, and uh, one of this, uh, one of the, of the most important uh, preparation is to build resilience in the societies, uh, in the economies, uh, in institutions, uh, in the media, in the uh, non-government organizations. Uh, so, um, <laughs> last two three days, uh, very intensively, we discussed what uh, and if and how will change um, in the um, United States policy towards Western Balkans after the elections. Uh, and um, did, what does it mean for, for the region? Uh, my opinion is that um, maybe there will be even more focus, uh, but the Balkans are in Europe. And their family, um, uh, it's European family. Of course, we work together with our friends from um, cross over the ocean to support uh, um, the resilience building uh, uh, initiatives among the Western Balkan countries. Uh, but uh, the true uh, um, driving aging of the reforms in that country is the European perspective of the Western Balkans. Um, I think that um, the fact that, uh, that we are still not uh, able to uh, approve negotiating framework uh, with North Macedonia doesn't mean that the process will stop. Bul Bul Bulgaria is, actually was, is and will be among the hardest supporter of the European perspective of the Western Balkans in the European, in the European Union. Uh, but those countries should also uh, take their responsibilities. And uh, Bulgaria agreed in March, actually the decision was taken in March. Now is the next step, it's a negotiating framework. We agreed in March for both countries to start negotiation talks. In the decision, uh, there is concrete text for implementation of the Good Neighbor Relationship Treaty with Bulgaria. And I want to thank Buyar and uh, his predecessor Nicola and all of our teams in the ministry uh, that they worked so close uh, during the whole period of the, the co-chairmanship. Uh, and it was excellent cooperation on daily base and daily base coordination. And I'm sure this also helped our teams to increase understanding uh, for each other. And uh, the dis despite the disputes that we have, uh, I'm happy that they didn't hinder the initiative. And I'm sure that tomorrow uh, there will be a very successful end of our joint uh, co-chairmanship. So I'm not agree that uh, enlargement uh, is dead and I hope uh, as you, Marco, said, this to be another brick in the bridge, not in the law. Okay, I, I hope that you have a historical uh, achievement uh, tomorrow on the summit. Your, your, your words bring me to, to my uh, last question for Minister uh, Osmani. Uh, the process, the Berlin process was envisaged to facilitate bilateral disputes and cooperation. So as it stands up to now, it has been successful in opening debates, but uh, closure of issues is still pending in most of the cases, uh, putting aside the case of North Macedonia 
and considering big steps forward uh, with the bilateral agreements uh, that were concluded with Bulgaria and Greece. So uh, did we use the mechanisms of the process sufficiently to resolve open issues? Or with uh, transferring them further on, we have burdened the new enlargement methodology that should what was intended, uh, that is intended uh, to focus purely on merit and deep oriented EU reforms. Hmm. Well, I agree that uh, one of the component, one, one component of the Berlin process is uh, through wider regional cooperation, through strengthened communication between uh, politics and businesses and people to people uh, to facilitate or aims to facilitate overcoming the bilateral uh, issues, everything in context, in light of European uh, integration. I think that uh, North Macedonia has uh, uh, moved uh, a lot forward in the last three years uh, in closing the outstanding issue with its neighbors. And uh, I think, and I usually repeat that, North Macedonia has uh, revived the European idea in the Balkans. If Europe was founded on two principles, and that was respecting diversity and reconciliation and good neighborly relations with the three agreements that we have signed or implemented in this period, we have revived that idea through the Ohrid framework agreement by accepting the diversity in the country and through the, the treaty with Bulgaria and PRESPA agreement that engaged us in a process of uh, reconciliation and uh, uh, good, uh, uh, good neighborliness. Of course, in the Balkans, these processes are work in progress. Uh, there are still bumps on the road to a genuine uh, good neighborliness. And unfortunately, that is at the account of the accession prospect of some of the countries aspiring to join the EU. And uh, <clears throat> I agree with you that this represents a burden to the new EU enlargement methodology, sidelining merit and reform-oriented process. Such, such processes provide fuel for those questioning the legitimacy and credibility of the EU enlargement process. But the only way forward to resolving open issues, fostering understanding and uh, uh, durable good neighborliness lies with the genuine political will, open dialogue and awareness for the necessity of a common European future. The Berlin process and the joint presidency demonstrated that if there is a political will, there is also a way for a functioning, positive, result-oriented environment. And we should capitalize on this experience and continue offering policy solutions that will improve or rectify past misunderstanding, remove obstacles for normal communication and strengthen bilateral links and sets the ground for for prosperous European future. Okay, thank you, Mr. Osmani, Mr. Zakharieva. It was a pleasure to, to uh, hear you and uh, to set the scene for our uh, next uh, panelists. I hope uh, that uh, this our uh, Balkan uh, co-presidency will be very much successful tomorrow because uh, this and next generations will. Uh, depend on, on the outcome definitely uh, on, on, uh, on, on the summit uh, that is about to happen. Uh, so I will hand over the floor to uh, uh, for, the, for the, the next uh, panel. Uh, we will discuss uh, Chinese regional approach in the Western Balkans and the EU response, uh, the panel that will be moderated uh, by uh, Vesela uh, Chernava. Once again, thank you, dear ministers, and good luck uh, tomorrow. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Marco. Um, we uh, know that in diplomacy, misunderstandings is a euphemism for big problems sometimes, uh, hopefully for smaller problems in our case. Um, we're going to talk, however, about a big issue, an issue that um, uh, has a very long perspective. We know China's approach towards anything, I guess, is uh, a long-durée approach. 
it it is not constrained by um, you know general affairs councils or core repair meetings. Um, it is a, a strategy, uh, rather, which spans over years and decades, and we have the feeling that actually the the the, the strategy by China that we see in the Balkans today uh, is one uh, which is changing. Uh, we think uh, that there is a that there is a a shift that we can observe if we look more carefully, that it's not only about infrastructure and investment anymore, uh, that there is uh, more to, uh, to the Chinese uh, imprint in the region. And given that China will continue being a topic not only here regionally, but also for Europe and also for the transatlantic relations, uh, as we go forward, no matter uh, the change of the president in, in the White House, uh, we thought it would be very uh, important and hopefully also interesting uh, to continue to, to, to continue tracing uh, uh, China's uh, impact here. Um, we want also to look at how the countries in the region respond to Chinese uh, uh, efforts and to Chinese policies, and what the EU can do or uh, or, or or is not doing enough of. Um, and I have a very capable uh, panel, um, and because we have been uh, having a lot of Bulgarian Macedonian voices just now, I will uh, start with Gergi Gergi Vurma from Albania. And I will give him the floor first. Uh, if you allow me, Gergi, can I just ask you to do maybe a couple of minutes on how you would characterize the Chinese approach in the region as such? Um, hello. Um, thank you for the invitation and uh, uh, congratulations to um, both ECFR and uh, uh, our colleagues from uh, Skopje on putting together these uh, events under this summit. Um, I suppose you started with me, Vesela, because um, probably Albania is the, the smallest problem when it comes to Chinese uh, Chinese influence or, or presence. Uh, this is the general um, the general perception in Albania, but I, I assume also in the, in the Western Balkan countries. Uh, in fact, there are only two major investments uh, of China in, in Albania. One is uh, in the oiling industry, uh, and the other one is the international Tirana International Airport, which the Chinese bought it from um, a Western consortium. Um, however, uh, for many of us in Albania, it's been really, uh, it's been really uh, weird uh, first to notice that uh, there is a radio, uh, a Chinese radio airing in, in uh, Albania. Uh, recently, I was surprised also to see some of the biggest real estate companies having one of the versions of their website also in Chinese. So it's in Albanian, in English, and and in in Chinese. Um, the perception, rightfully, as you pointed out, uh, has always been that uh, China is out to do business. Um, I don't think that China is out in just doing business in the world uh, anymore, and uh, certainly not, um, it's not doing business only in the Balkans as well. I mean, the Balkans maybe is not so important, uh, or uh, maybe the, the Balkans' importance is not solely related to to, provide it, uh, to providing access for China to, to EU market. Uh, I strongly, strongly believe that uh, China is out to influence uh, and um, it certainly has its own um, priorities and uh, strategic objectives in, in doing so. Uh, so, uh, of course, it's a huge uh, economic power. It's a, it's a, it's a market uh, that uh, many uh, world economies would like to access and to build uh, friendly relations with, including the European Union. 
uh, but uh, China's plans go, in my opinion, far beyond that. Uh, China has important strategic priorities on its own that wants to, to promote and to find ways um, to, to build support around the world. And uh, why not sell also its own model uh, of, of the economy, of the political system, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, lastly, when it comes to the Western Balkans, if you look at the uh, EU progress reports over the past two years, you will notice different, uh, let's say, conclusions for each of the countries as regards the presence of China or Russia or uh, recently even, even the Gulf countries. Sometimes I get the impression that uh, China has been, has been a bit silent or has been uh, has had a sort of low profile in this in this uh, kind of debate. So we've been uh, we've been discussing uh, Russian influence or uh, the influence coming from the Gulf countries, and we've been sitting on China's lap uh, when it comes to to the priorities that China um, wants to to promote. Um, so the last point is that. Uh, China's uh, attempt to influence or to insert its presence in in uh, countries in the region is not individual, uh, does not ta target one single country. Uh, its impact actually uh, targets the region. So if we speak that, uh, if we uh, see today in Serbia or in Montenegro, very large uh, presence of Chinese uh, economic presence or, or Chinese influence, I think that's the reason that Albania, Macedonia, Kosovo, uh, Bosnia and other countries should also uh, start to, to, to be concerned. I think I'll stop here. Thanks a lot and I'll come back to you. Maybe I can, uh, however, ask Zoran uh, whether he agrees with what, what you just said. Um, that China has no individual approach towards the region, that it's much more the region as a whole, uh, uh, and that we are a bit in the business of, of buying Chinese model. Zoran. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vesela. Uh, uh, I will comply with what Georgi said. Uh, Beijing foreign policy approach to this part of Europe is mostly regional than country specific. If you analyze the ways in which Chinese projects project their influence in the Western Balkans, one might find a clear pattern. For the time being, is purely economical. However, in time, has a perspective to become very political. There are even signs of it now. If we take the example of North Macedonia and Serbia, uh, we have already experienced such a behavior uh, and pressure by Beijing by not aligning with the EU declaration concerning the deployment of missiles on the island in the South China Sea. The corrosive capital that is coming from China, channeled through non-competitive loan conditions set by a state-owned Chinese banks and implemented in mostly or almost fully by Chinese companies threaten the democratically established institutions and market economy by exploiting our own Western Balkans governance gaps. This also raises serious concern about our own, let's say, Western Balkan authorities' resilience to corruption and our own willingness, or not our own, but the willingness of the uh, political elites to ignore the rule of law and executive projects of this kind, of this kind in a very non-inclusive manner. Therefore, the China's way of working, according to me, is completely opposite from the political, but also economical, economic model and liberal values that these countries from the Western Balkans strive towards on their path towards EU and NATO. Well, at least a, a big part of, of Western Balkans. Okay, but if you ask probably some of the prime ministers in the Balkans, 
they would say, fine, but if we lack enough uh, you know, foreign capital, uh, if Europeans don't invest enough, then why should we shy away from the Chinese capital? Yeah, but we are not talking about blocking any investments. We are talking about channeling this investment in a clear and transparent manner by not avoiding our public procurement legislation, which from, it differs from, from country to country. Uh, the level of alignment is different, but at least to uh, comply with the public procurement legislation that is existing in this country. This is the only thing that is uh, that could block any potential investment by, uh, by Chinese. We are not saying that we don't want Chinese money. We are just saying that they have, they have to be channeled through a competitive uh, and a fully transparent procedure. And when you say that the political, that the economic um, impact is transforming into a political one, what do you mean exactly? Maybe if you can unpack that a bit. Well, I, I, I already mentioned, I will just reiterate, um, we are actually now, at, at this point in time, it is mostly economical. So these countries in the Western Balkans are open to uh, for investments, or better say loans, that are coming from, from China, right? At this moment in time, we haven't experienced uh, clear pressure or influence by China on the way our political elites have performed. However, in time, when there is a subject of interest towards China, most probably, as we have seen with the South China Sea uh, uh, Declaration, the pressure will come and the countries will not align with the EU, with the EU position, which makes uh, which can create potentially a problem once these countries uh, become members of the European Union. Thanks. Um, I'll now turn to Vladimir Shapov, our ECFR uh, fellow who just returned from a trip across the Balkans. Um, what is your take on looking at the region uh, on both issues, I think, which were mentioned very clearly? Uh, by Gergen Zoran, the regional uh, approach, but also the economic versus political approach that mm. we see? Well, let me start with the second question, because I think it's the more pertinent one at the present time. And uh, before I respond, uh, maybe I should say that we have been in the middle of a very extensive research project that we have been doing for almost a year now, and in the context of which we have talked to almost 100 people across the region. And uh, I think that the picture that is emerging is quite different from the currently prevailing uh, perceptions and uh, understandings of China's uh, presence in, in the region in, in a number of ways. One is that we are clearly seeing a move beyond economics. Uh, yes, it's not so pronounced. Yes, it's pretty nascent. It's not very visible to many people, even to us, before we began our, uh, our research. But there are already signs, very clear signs, for instance, in uh, sustained increases of Chinese uh, engagement in the field of academia, in the, in the media, in, uh, even in some civil society uh, activities. So that is, clearly, that is clearly beginning to happen. It's going beyond politics. Um, I mean, I can maybe, maybe later in the conversation, I can say a couple of things about political, the political dimensions of this, because there is a clear pattern there as well, uh, in the sense that uh, up until a couple of years ago, maybe governments in the region would have been expected on, you know, uh, on the part of the Chinese uh, to take certain positions on the one China policy on Taiwan. But the list of issues and, and, uh, is constantly expanding. Uh, we, are now getting, we are now having governments uh, being very aggressively 
uh, spoken to by the Chinese on issues relating to Xinjiang, to Taiwan, to the protests in Hong Kong. Uh, again, they choose how to make this public in different countries in different ways. Sometimes it's not so pronounced, sometimes it's more private. Uh, so even, even at this level, we're already seeing uh, a very clear trend. But the other, the other interesting points about Chinese presence is that it, it's not just becoming multifaceted, but it's also becoming interconnected. So what we are seeing now is that there are in emerging and very clear linkages between different areas and, and um, uh, areas of cooperation. Uh, and the best way to illustrate this is speak of, to, to talk about nexuses. Uh, and, and let me give you a couple of, a couple of examples. Uh, so for instance, there is a very clear nexus of rising cooperation between uh, academia and civil society. There is an uptick in uh, cooperation at the university, among universities, mostly pr uh, private universities. That is now spilling over into civil society uh, activities. You're beginning to see these interconnections at the, at the personality level, at the topic level. Uh, so so that's, that's already emerging. Another nexus, which is again already, at least to my mind, uh, increasingly apparent, is this linkage between business and media. In other words, you have an uptick in content about China, in media outlets which are in some countries very close to the government, work with the government on Chinese on Chinese projects. So again, you know, this is uh, this is one one illustration. And my last point, you know, to, to, to answer your qu first question, is that we are seeing also a multi-level strategy. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is uh, one of the very interesting findings of, of our research, because the last couple of years, we have been focusing a bit too much on the big sort of headline items of Chinese engagement. Which is, of course, you know, it I makes mean, sense. Investment. Yeah, big investments, you know, highways, energy, infrastructure. But it's very clear that the Chinese are now much more active at a pretty granular level. And by that, I mean, you know, engaging with individuals, uh, you know, with institutions, non state institutions, uh, you know, to give you a couple of exa examples. Uh, you know, completely renovate the state film archive in one country, offer, you know, full re-equipment of a major media outlet in another country. Uh, and interestingly, a lot of these activities are not necessarily visible, they're not necessarily publicly, publicly analyzed. Uh, so, uh, but to be very clear, this is, uh, this is still a nascent Situation. I mean, it's uh, although in a way, China is coming to the end of its kind of initial stage of entry of, of the region. Uh, you know, this is still not. You know, if you, if we sort of discuss it in comparative, in a comparative manner, this is still not of the magnitude, intensity, depth of presence that we have in relation to other more traditional. Uh, third actors, but we should not underestimate the point that all of these things have actually been achieved within less than a decade, uh, and uh, I think this is a ma major, uh, major consideration that we have to uh, that we have to bear in mind. And very briefly on your point about the regional uh, approach, yes, China does have a regional uh, approach. But again, what we are finding is that there is incredible variance within uh, their, uh, um, you know, the, the range of tools and instruments and how they are applied in, the, in different in different countries. So, although we, you know we might have a regional fr framework, this this by this does not necessarily mean that you have a uniform and even application uh, of the different tools that the Chinese have at their disposal. They're in fact very flexible, they're learning very quickly, they're trying some things in some countries, other things in other countries. They're, you know, they're utilizing 
situational opportunities as they arise in one country or another country. Uh, so the regional approach and the regional framework is a very useful starting point of how we think about uh, what China is doing. Uh, but I think it can be slightly misleading if we ignore the kind of variance and cross-application that we are beginning to see from one country into the next. Thank you. I'm afraid we will not be able to delve into the individual countries too much, but I was wondering, listening to both ministers, right, they said um, that they thought the Western Balkans common market and the green agenda are the two major things for the Berlin process. How do you think this is going to, I don't know, interplay with uh, China's plans for the region? How does that, uh, how that does, does, does that help or impede those plans? I don't know who would like to, to, to take this one. Maybe Gergi? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, I might be wrong, but my sense is that um, Balkans is too small. Um, so if um, China succeeds or fails uh, with its uh, attainment of, of its strategic objectives, um, the Balkans would be a collateral damage on the way. Um, because I don't think um, our efforts here uh, for intra-regional cooperation and expanding the uh, the pace of uh, of internal integration is what uh, would uh, would stop um, China. Um, I think that countering China's influence uh, starts in the EU. Uh, starts in the EU in the sense that um, we might analyze as much as we want uh, the, the interplay uh, of our countries and, and China, but actually, in the meantime, China has already reached EU member states. Zoran mentioned that um, uh, one of the, the uh, opportunities that China would uh, take is uh, by jeopardizing the, the common positions of the EU foreign policy. It has already done that, right? Um, and you cannot do that by um, penetrating the Western Balkans. You need to do that by penetrating member states. And China has already done that in, the, in Hungary, uh, uh, considering then the, the level of FDIs in some other countries, in Finland, in, in Malta, in uh, Luxembourg. Um, but the thing is, the point is for, for us in the Western Balkans, and I, I uh, fully agree with my, my colleague here, the point with my colleague um, Zoran, uh, the point is uh, we need to focus on uh, our standards. So the main resilience mechanism that the Western Balkans uh, 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 has to invest in in order to successfully face those pressures coming from uh, from China or any other uh, West, uh, Eastern uh, or malign influence is to focus on the rule of law standards, to focus on the, the standards of, of democracy. Therefore, uh, when we speak about um, Chinese or Russian or uh, uh, influence from uh, from other uh, uh, from other other uh, countries, we need to speak about the quality of democracy. We need to speak about the, the quality of rule of law, not only on paper but also in practice. How do uh, 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 these these investments um, or or uh, money that comes with the strings attached affect uh, our daily lives and affect above all all our our uh, relations with the with with rule of law so what you're saying is that if the eu cannot uh, uh, as of yet agree or let's say on a common 5g strategy it's too much to ask of the western balkans and in the meantime uh, we can have i don't know how many surveillance cameras uh, and uh, data breaches in the region. 
in a way, yes. Um, I th uh, what I'm saying is that uh, you cannot uh, ask from a small region like Western Balkans uh, to counter that or to act as the first barrier to China's or any other influence uh, if you have already failed uh, failed at home. For instance, one of the debates that uh, struck me um, recently is that uh, whether the EU would organize uh, an EU-China summit where uh, all heads of uh, states and, and governments of member states would participate. But in the meantime, EU has not organized uh, any such uh, summit uh, with the US, uh, with, with Canada, with, uh, I don't know, uh, Australia, uh, whichever, whichever other country with whom the EU and, and our Western world should share much more than, than just, uh, just economic priorities, shares values, uh, uh, shares democratic values, shares uh, other strategic interests, including the 5G that, uh, as, as, uh, uh, as you mentioned. Therefore, um, when it comes then back to uh, the debate of EU and the, and the Western Balkans, I said at the beginning that countering China's influence starts at the, uh, at the EU, not simply because the EU has to be, to provide that positive uh, example, that, that uh, model that we will uh, eventually uh, uh, follow. Uh, it's in EU's interest as much as in our interest um, to build that uh, those resilience mechanisms uh, both in the, in the Western Balkan region as much as uh, in the uh, in the EU, but uh, it cannot be a one side, uh, you know, uh, a demand that you know uh, you in the Western Balkans need need to do that. No, we need to build more frank uh, discussion about that. Um, the two ministers discussed um, uh, in the first panel about the achievements of the Berlin process. I think it will be much healthy for the uh, healthier for the Berlin process and for us in the Western Balkans to talk also about the failures um, of, of the, the Berlin process. The Berlin process has a lot of opportunities and a lot of um, untapped uh, potential to deliver also in the uh, in relation to to. Uh, preventing malign influences, penetrating the region and further the EU. Thanks a lot. Um, I, I want to tell our attendees here um, that if they want to take the floor, please raise your hand. I cannot see you, so unless you, uh, you write to me or you raise your hand, I cannot give you the floor. Um, maybe Zoran, uh, he yeah. wanted to, and then I come back sure. to Vlado. Uh, d on this uh, common market and green deal uh, question, maybe? Yeah, just, just to give uh, a little bit more perspective why the rule of law is so important. Uh, and not only that, but it's also the whole, uh, the money that are channeled through, uh, through the Berlin process. So first on the economic impact, um, currently we have uh, 39 projects under the umbrella of the connectivity agenda. So that's 32 projects in transport and seven in the energy sector. Some of them are, have been initiated on the first summit in Berlin. None of these 39 projects have been 100% fully implemented by now. So we are talking about 39 connectivity projects that some of them have been initi initiated six years ago and haven't been uh, concluded. This speaks as much for the Western Balkan, but also how the money are channeled, uh, how European money are channeled through um, uh, to, to the countries. Uh, what else? Uh, we have, uh, it, it is, there, there are many factors that influence this, uh, your question, or the answer to your question. Uh, one of them is the necessary legislation. As I have already, point out, in most cases, we have, the, we have the legislation that enables uh, transparency uh, in the process. However, this, this uh, legislation is bypassed. If we take the example of, 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 of my country, of North Macedonia, the way the, man, the, 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 the money were channeled in our system was through bypassing the 
public procurement legislation and going through a Lex Specialis, with which they override the way the money are channeled, the funds are channeled through the process, through to, in the country. So you can have the legislation, but if there is a political willingness to use this money, they will find the politicians will will eventually find find a way to to channel them. Then we go to the political arena. In the political arena, what we need or what the politicians are asking for, and we can, you know, we can uh, quote the ministers that were previously here. Uh, they need the funds, and here we are not talking. That, okay, now with the with the uh, with the new agenda, with the green agenda, with the economic plan, etc. There is a huge amount of money that it has been allocated for the region. We have to wait and see how this will be channeled, how this will be processed, and how it will be, how it will be, uh, will be used. But the question is, uh, if this money are going to be used as loans, something that also, uh, you know, other uh, foreign uh, countries are offering, or they are going to be channeled through mostly as grants to the country. That's also a very, very important, very important, uh, very important issue. Staying on the political agenda, as, as a politician thinks, he thinks in, in one mandate, maximum two mandates, right? If you don't have something which is called like the EU perspective, then why to go through the whole process and wait and to, you know, wait for all the EU institution and everything to be quite neatly organized in order to use certain amount of money. When you can go to the Chinese without any particular condition to take the money, although we have seen in majority of the cases, almost all cases in the Western Balkan, that in the end, the citizens of these countries pay much more than is initially, initially expect, uh, expected. So you have political leadership, you have the EU perspective, and you have Finally, the necessary uh, legislative landscape that can be used in order to impede uh, Chinese uh, influence. Mm -hmm. Zoran, do you think that uh, countries should try to cope on their own? Uh, I, I agree with you on the rule of law stuff, obviously. But if we're talking about, uh, let's say, penetration of investment that may be unwanted for other reasons, or penetration of other non-economic fields, as Vlado was mentioning, do you think countries should push back? Or sh they should, as, as Gergi was indicating, use the example and the help of the EU? Yeah, I, I would go with Gergi. I think that the, the countries does not, do not have the capacities to cope with these kind of challenges. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, the EU as assistance, both human and technical, is necessary for such for this kind of uh, this kind uh, of things. And eventually, it is also to the political leadership to understand this and work with the people and in with the European Union to find proper ways of uh, attracting more money from, let's say. Western uh, or countries that share our Western values instead of other third actors which have different uh, different visions uh, of the world. Well, I mean, I, I, I agree with most of the points that my colleagues have made. Uh, maybe just to add a couple of a couple of things, uh, I certainly agree on the importance of context and the end of geopolitical ambivalence. You know, clearly, as long as the region is in such, you know, find itself in such geopolitical uncertainty, yes, there are going to be opportunities, yes, there are going to be incentives of all types by various actors to engage in these types of activities. I fully agree with that. On the other hand, you know, clearly memberships matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's very, very obvious that NATO membership for many countries in the region has been a, a very significant factor in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of blocking the ability of China to penetrate certain areas, 
in security, in 5G. I mean, you know, there can be no denying of that fact. Uh, the other really important point is that I, I would still insist that we have not sufficiently mapped, uh, analyzed the type of presence that China has in the region. Because there are lots of very peculiar features and characteristics to this, to, their, to, to, what to what they're doing. Even in areas where we have been focusing on in terms of investments in economy. And let me give you, again, a couple of examples. Uh, a lot of people say, well, yes, there is no conditionality. Well, in fact, there is conditionality, only it's with Chinese characteristics. Uh, and that conditionality in, uh, you know, has very interesting components. One is that it has, it, it, it's very, very um, ambivalent, and it contains jurisdictional traps. You know, we know the jurisdictional trap surrounding the Montenegro uh, highway. Uh, you know, how, under what jurisdiction litigation will be, will be taking place. But again, you know, this has to be made public. This has to be made clear to, to publics, to citizens, so that they're aware of this. The other more obvious Chinese characteristic of non-conditionality, if I can put it this way, of course, is the financial price, as, as my colleagues already mentioned. But there are other, but, but there are other elements, and, and some, we're going to be discussing some of these in the next panel. One conditionality is that you know, if you get this kind of investments, uh, the price that you pay is the non-application of certain standards in environments, in protection, in the way you manage your, uh, you know, your fiscal uh, policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so again, you know, we, need, we need to be clearer about these, this type of these characteristics, uh, uh, and, 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 and we need to have a process whereby uh, this, you know, China is no longer kind of able to enjoy this kind of, uh, you know, the attraction of promise, the kind of uh, hide and bide uh, position in which they have been, in which they have been operating in the region. Well, clearly, this is not so far. This has not. This has not happened predominantly because of the behavior of incumbents, uh, because there is no. You know, why would you want to reveal the precise conditions and implication uh, of, of, your engagement, of your engagement with China? Uh, but I think the EU, once we go down the road of EU accession negotiations, I think you know, the e, both the EU and the negotiating countries are going to have uh, an expanding set of opportunities um, to block this kind of process of creating facts on the ground, as, as, I, as I like to call it, in a kind of non, in the non sort of, you know, the non-Russian way of, in which we, you know, in which we apply, in which we apply this term. And, and we know how this can be done. You know, you can do it via the front loading of specific uh, provisions of the key communautaire, uh, you know, in terms of how you manage your public finances, uh, in terms of transparency, yes, of course, you're not, you know, you're not solving the problem entirely because we have the, the case of Hungary, you know, where, in, you know, where mm -hmm. contracts have now been made state secret for over, for over a decade. So, but but, you're, but you're, you're kind of slowly contracting the space for these types of uh, uh, activities. And I think this is where we should be uh, heading, both in terms of our analysis, but also in terms of how we uh, engage and contribute uh, as non sort of you know, as policy actors in this process. There is a question uh, in the chat from uh, our colleague Plamen Tonche from Athens. Uh, he asked uh, uh, Vladu, but also if Zoran and Gergi want to chip in. Um, while it is obvious that China makes most of the cracks in governance systems in the Western Balkan countries, it is also not a, is it also not a matter of a welcoming attitude for whatever reasons, as it seems to be the case in Serbia and to a lesser extent in Montenegro? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, you know, there, are obvious, uh, there are obvious reasons for this. Uh, one, of course, is that you know, there is a certain normative 
affinity, let's, let's put it this way, between uh, you know, the political philosophy and the governing philosophy of people like you know, Vucic uh, and the Chinese way of politically doing things. So there is that, there's no denying that. There's also, and you know, my colleagues already mentioned that, there is, there is kind of uh, development rationality behind this, uh, behind this type of cooperation as well. Uh, because yes, you have to overcome significant divergences in you know in development. In some cases, you know, due to certain absences or you know lack of convincing approach or funds by you know by the EU. So that's clearly that's clearly uh, that's clearly an opportunity. Uh, it's an opportunity that both sides are utilizing. But again, I would say that overall the last couple of years, and certainly in terms of where we are heading, China is going to gradually begin to lose this advantage. You know, A, because its presence and sort of power will be revealed for a variety of reasons. And I guess the other really significant factor is that we have to bear in mind that so far China has basically conducted its business in the Western Balkans completely unhindered. Uh, it has not really been the focus of attention. It has not really been under any type of serious pressure, either from governments, from oppositions, I should say, or from civil society or from publics. We know that is gradually changing as well. You know, we have lots of cases in Montenegro, in Serbia. Yes, they're kind of still small scale, quite local, but that's kind of, you know, slowly uh, you know, finding its way. So I think we're about to witness a series of changes in the coming, in the coming years, which will make this type of, uh, you know, this type of behavior uh, more difficult on the part of, uh, of those politicians in, you know, in, in this region, uh, you know, who are quite tempted to utilize uh, the relationships that they have had with the Chinese so far. Thanks. I was wondering, uh, Zoran is, is, uh, is in agreement. I was wondering whether it's only about the weakness and the capacity of the country, because I think in the Serbian case, it may not be that much a lack of capacity, but it's uh, maybe an access of, uh, an excess of uh, willingness. Zoran. Hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, and I think that, especially especially in Serbia, this is the case. But these these are one of the patterns that we have detected detected while analyzing uh, the ways Chinese influence the region. So they uh, uh, first, what we need is to build the resilience of the institution that deals with these kind of issues. Sure. And second, what is the pattern is that actually the Chinese go directly to the people that can deliver their results. And those are the ruling or the political elites. In, in Serbia, it's Vucic uh, previously for the agreements for the highways. In, in, in North Macedonia, was uh, was Gruevski. And there was also a, a procedure, uh, a court procedure against the prime minister and a couple of other ministers in our courts. So we see who are the Chinese aiming at directly. So they know whom to address these issues, the ones that can really deliver on what they request. And they request non-transparency, they request procedure without, you know, uh, without really monitoring what is going on in the, in the implementation. So, uh, so definitely there is a, uh, there is a linkage uh, here, but I would, I would go back uh, and just refer something that, that also Vladimir mentioned before. Uh, it also becomes clear uh, that the lack of political commitment to the Western Balkan EU integration, and this is here I'm talking also by certain member states in the European, uh, in the European Union. They create uh, or creates and promotes uh, significant and potentially detrimental opportunities for such actors like China to pursue their economic and geopolitical interests. In, in, in simple words, uh, we have 
skeptical EU member states, which are providing helping hand to these third countries that have diverse interests from the EU ones. And by doing so, they obstruct the enhancement of the EU strategic autonomy. So we are making ourselves vulnerable from within, not from outside. We are actually helping uh, the others to, to, to penetrate. And this creates long-term risks to the regions, but also European Union's democratic and economic, economic, uh, uh, and economic uh, development. So therefore, we have already promoted a couple of um, a uh, couple of recommendations. Some of them are related to the Western Balkan countries, some of them uh, to the European Union, in how to organize the whole accession process. So one of them is to introduce, as this is the intention of the current Commission, to introduce qualified majority voting in the accession process and to avoid any more ridiculous bilateral issues hampering the progress of these countries. We have a new methodology for enlargement, for accession negotiation, which provides the necessary space for political actors to closely monitor the process. However, we don't have to, political engagement does not equal politicization or instrumentalization of the accession process. The new framework offers ample opportunities to assist the Western Balkan countries on the other side. So these are the positive effects. So we have economic integration, economic accession criteria have been placed in the most important fundamental cluster. In this, so this cluster also encompasses chapters which are related to public procurement, financial control, and statistics. These are all part of this fundamental cluster. So therefore, excursions uh, from future member states from the Western Balkans will be likely very difficult to conduct in the future as they will be under severe monitoring by the European Union. And this is if they start accession negotiation. But here, the EU leverage is important. And on the other side, the credibility is important. If you don't have the credibility, the leverage is low, and the EU will perform poorly in the region. So that's concerning the, 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 whole, uh, the whole accession framework. The second concrete proposal, and this goes for the Western Balkan countries, is to align with the EU regulations that deal with screening foreign investments, which have explicit provisions for the engagements of various stakeholders in the investment screening mechanism and improve the transparency in the investments, digital security and environmental protection. So something that we are all complaining by the Chinese investments slash loans in, um, in the region. This kind of, of alignment will allow the Western Balkan countries to neutralize the corrosive capital and enhance the, con the contribution of constructive capital, which will eventually develop, uh, lead to sustainable development and, and growth. However, as we have mentioned before, the countries cannot do it on their own. They need the EU assistance. So with the alignment, these countries will need, and significantly, human and technical uh, assistance. Because without it, we can have another legislation on a paper on which we are going to be fully aligned with the European Union, but not having the capacities to implement it. So we, have, we haven't done nothing. And in the end, as, as all the ministers mentioned, this should go with increasing funds coming from the European Union itself, channeled through not grants, uh, sorry, not loans, but grants. So we need fresh money in the region so we can implement it, implement the project, especially huge one, infrastructural ones, swiftly. That will be my take. Which will probably t take us back to your qualified majority voting <laughs> part. <laughs> but let's not get there. I would suggest we um, dwell a bit indeed on what Zoran suggested, namely what can be done. Um, and I agree that starting from the big narrative about the credibility of the EU perspective, but also maybe going down to, to kind of more technical things, right? 
you talked about procurement, but I guess uh, there are also other ways to think about it. Yeah, I mean, there is, one, there is one very serious issue which we don't really address in these discussions in terms of how we actually calibrate our response to corrosive capital. And normally the way that this is done is via the notion of legal compliance, where basically we're saying, well, as long as the Chinese are transparent, as long as the Chinese comply with the relevant legislation on environmental standards, on you know, whatever type of standard. But actually the, the problem is, goes deeper because, and we are already seeing this within the union, not so much on the, in the non-members, you know, non-EU members of, 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 uh, in Southeast Europe. But you know, as long as there is this incredible discrepancy between the two models of operation, of functioning, we, we, we are going to have to, at some point, to address the issue of whether we can be content with the idea of creating somehow a level playing field in which one side is clearly politically, uh, in, in, in terms of its governing philosophy model, is subsidizing in a sustained manner the actors which are operating within the European Union. I mean, we know from the history of, the, you know, the, from Chinese political economy that there is a range of companies that are created solely with the purpose to try out different models of internationalization, of penetration of foreign markets. Companies that are almost designed to fail in order, in order, to, in order to try out different modes, different strategies, different approach, approaches. We know that there, are you know that there are companies which are, as a matter of strategy, supported through an, a very expansive range of instruments, financial, governance, you know, tax, you, you name it. Uh, so, yes, compliance is crucial. Yes, it's important you know, across the entire range of, uh, of areas and you know, dimensions. But at some point, we have to address the question of whether this is going to be enough. Because the other side, you know, is clearly operating under a governance, you know, in general terms, a governance model that has an inbuilt advantage, as it, as it were. You know, if, if you simply evaluate uh, their activities, you know, through price, you know, through such, uh, you know, through such financial uh, instruments. And we, I mean, I know the EU is kind of beginning to have this conversation and it's kind of getting somewhere. But even within this discussion, you know, we are still more or less looking uh, at certain, you know, critical infrastructure um, uh, investments, but, n but is not treating this as a, as a wider kind of uh, issue that in fact has a much wider uh, relevance. Uh, because, you know, w what is to stop Chinese companies, you know, uh, you know, multiplying what they're doing in Croatia, the Pelisovac uh, bridge. I mean, you know, if we do not address and then if we do not confront this issue from a more systemic uh, perspective, and this is where it gets really difficult, because this type of conversation will be very difficult in certain uh, member states, and we are not quite certain whether the EU will get anywhere. But from what you're saying, I get the impression that Trump was right to include the 5G clause in whatever bilateral agreement they signed uh, Vucic and Hoti in, in Washington. Uh, well, I, I no think no matter the, the that the agreement had nothing to do with China and well, technology. Well, I mean, you know, my take on this was, you know, comes from a different angle uh, to the extent to which you know 5G is just a subset of the crucial issue of the infrastructure of our future of our future economy you know hence you know all the all the other relevant and applicable uh, security uh, security implications but yes if you specifically address uh, the 5g question through this more systemic approach through this more systemic uh, deconstruction let's say of how you get a certain chinese actor or a certain Chinese company to be in such a predominant uh, uh, market situation, well, yes, this, certain, this certainly raises serious uh, questions. 
I think this is uh, not impossible for the EU to think along these lines, uh, but that would require mm. probably uh, a, a much more, much more flexibility. Sure. Gergi, you want to, do you want to maybe come back to my question of what can be done? Uh, maybe you have a brilliant idea that, uh, that uh, we can finish with, but also bearing in mind that the second panel will be about the practical impact of all of, all of that, the, about the pollution, about surveillance, about people feeling suppressed uh, with the help of Chinese technology. I mean, what can be done? Well, I, I'm not sure I have brilliant ideas as to what can be done. Uh, I, I have good jokes, though, uh, <laughs> from the Albanian good. perspective. Um, so um, I, I did a little bit of, um, you know, I reached out at some people in the past few days to, to check with them some of my um, thoughts and, and, and ideas that I wanted to share here. And uh, I, I specifically asked them, um, both in the government and also in the in the expert community, civil society se um, uh, sector, uh, how come um, Albania has not such a, a huge presence or or articulated influence from China um, at the political level? Because the political level was what really really worries me uh, in Albania, but also uh, even more in the, in the region. And, and uh, uh, some, some of their explanations were that, uh, well, we have this uh, special relationship with the US, uh, which thank God is pushing us a lot. So uh, if uh, the US ambassador says something, uh, that needs to be done, and there's no question about it. Uh, the other explanation was that, uh, well, the Chinese were, were also um, a bit too cheap because they thought increasing our FDI would, would be enough, you know. Uh, but obviously for, for our political leaders, it was not uh, because FDIs are one thing and uh, access to pool of money uh, to, to pursue personal and uh, narrow political agenda are a completely different thing. Uh, so maybe these are, the, are, are um, uh, what, what saved us, the Chinese themselves and the US. Uh, I'm not sure whether that could be replicated in the region, maybe to a certain extent in Kosovo, we'll see about that uh, under the new uh, Biden uh, administration. But um, let's get more serious. Um, I, I really think that, um, I stressed a bit earlier, that the key to our resilience, to our internal resilience, is uh, our, our standards and our uh, democratic, uh, democratic standards, uh, both uh, in the letter and in the, in the practice. When it comes to Chinese uh, presence and influence, I fully agree with, the, with uh, Shopov here. Um, in the past few years, we've been walking a bit in the dark, and we've been looking and worrying uh, a lot about, um, rightfully though, uh, Russian influence, uh, uh, influence coming from the Gulf countries and so on, and we somehow uh, ignored a bit what were the Russians doing. So the first instinct tells you that when you walk in dark, uh, until you figure out whether you, what's the thing that you might be crashing is, the minimum thing that you can do is, is to switch on the light. Uh, uh, so we can start seeing, start analyzing, and eventually figuring out uh, things as we go, as we walk. But at least we won't be walking in the dark. Thank you very much. Zoran looks like uh, he carries the light. Zoran, do you have an idea? <laughs> okay, let's end up with a brilliant idea. Now, we're living in very interesting times. This COVID-19 crisis see the disruption in, in the supply chains, in the world's supply chain. And if we can, if, if the Western Balkan, when, when a lot of companies are talking about shortening the supply chains, uh, the Western Balkan has a competitive advantage. 
it's the localization of supply chain that really provides them, you know, the vicinity to the European Union provides them with the opportunity, a lot of European and US companies, but also, you know, companies that share the, the Western values to invest in the region so we can become more, the, the Western Balkan countries can become more part of the global supply chains. If we take just a little bit, little small part of the world's supply chains, that will be great and a lot of problems will be resolved in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you we, will, we will basically prescribe to the politicians who are meeting tomorrow that they should please make sure that at least uh, two or three big companies resettle to the region, <laughs> uh, non-Chinese, right? That will be a sufficient start. Let's put it like that. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. With this, I will close this panel and give you 13 minutes of break. Uh, nothing fat fatal here, nothing fatalist. Uh, mm -hmm. And we will reconvene at quarter past uh, with uh, Valerie Hopkins and the civil society representatives. Thank you all uh, for being part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're on.
Good. Okay, the mic is on. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second panel on this um, very interesting conference about geopolitics and, and the region. Um, I'm very excited to have what I hope is a, a very interesting discussion about some individual case studies now that the, pan that the uh, stage has been set for us so well, sort of uh, the wider uh, geopolitical context and the arc of, um, of the discussion and, and of geopolitical interference in the region. Um, I'm Valerie Hopkins. I am the Financial Times' Southeast Europe correspondent, and I'm very happy to have rem here together with me, two people you already know, and remotely, I'm happy to introduce um, four panelists, uh, most of whom I know and have met in person um, and <laughs> gone reporting with, um, but unfortunately couldn't be here with us today. Um, so first we have uh, Jovan Rajic uh, from RERI, the Renewables and Environmental Regulatory Institute in Serbia. Denis Zisko from the Center for Ecology and Energy in Bosnia, Herzegovina. Jovan Amarovic from the Politikon Network in Montenegro, um, who is a member of BIAPAG as well. And Danilo Krivokapic from the SHARE Foundation. Um, I think it will be great to have um, a very concrete discussion about not only what civil society is doing um, to be engaged in environmental activism, and but how um, some of the geopolitical issues that we discussed are affecting you know your or your lives, the lives of ordinary people, um, and the people on whose behalf you advocate for. So, without further ado, uh, maybe I will ask Jovan to take the floor first. Um, Jovan, you are working for a nonprofit that. Is a, was established to protect, preserve, and improve the environment through law enforcement. Um, and you give valuable support to initiatives across Serbia when it comes um, to expert adv legal advice. So um, you recently filed a lawsuit against, or you've been in, engaged in ongoing um, litigation against the planned Linglong tire factory in Zraninin. Um, can you tell us about a little bit about the lawsuit, how you've built your arguments, um, and how the suit is also being received uh, by the wider public in Serbia and, and by the government um, who have made Linglong into a big partner um, in Serbia. And I think even the Serbian Superliga is now named the Linglong Superliga. So you must be up against quite a formidable opponent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for a for, for question and for invitation to participate uh, in this conference today. And first of all, I'm very sorry for not being in in Bulgaria in person, because uh, because uh, we are uh, looking forward to travel again. So it's a uh, it's uh, uh, it would be a pleasure to be there, but unfortunately it, it, it wasn't possible this time. And good afternoon to to all uh, other panelists and to to all participants. Uh, yes, as you said, uh, we feel the complaint against. Uh, Ling Long, you probably meant to criminal charges submitted two days ago, but uh, actually we are participate, uh, participating in uh, roughly uh, 15 legal procedures against uh, Ling Long since the beginning of, of uh, uh, this uh, project implementation in Serbia. Unfortunately, uh, it was followed by a lot of irregularities and breaches of uh, positive regulation of of Serbia. Uh, this relates to to very initial phase of project implementation when the investor uh, uh, explained that uh, environmental uh, uh, environmental protection laws are not something that they should uh, uh, con even concern in this initial phase and that uh, environmental impact assessment should not be uh, actually uh, obtained uh, in this uh, initial phase of, of project implementation. And unfortunately, government of Serbia, more precisely, uh, city of Zrenjanin and the autonomous province of Vojvodina uh, agreed to this. And uh, by this action, they practically legalized something which is not uh, illegal. So we have a procedures now uh, related to construction permits, which are subsequently issued by one by one. And we have a, a criminal procedure uh, initiated by our part 
because of uh, illegal construction and uh, third area let's say of of our claims is related to as i said environmental uh, impact assessments uh, regulations which were brutally neglected i would say in this uh, in this phase so um, just to, to 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 summarize this part about uh, ling long it is not the only project in serbia which is uh, uh, implemented in this way uh, unfortunately there is uh, it's not a precedent there is um, uh, several very uh, uh, very disputable and very uh, unordinary projects that are uh, developing currently in Serbia and the plants that are operating without uh, without uh, proper uh, environmental and construction permits without uh, proper uh, standards uh, ecological standards fulfilled and uh, uh, unfortunately i can't see that this trend will change in a, in a near future because it's an ongoing uh, process that that is uh, uh, that is uh, only extending more and more uh, just to follow up quickly i mean um, how how are your um, legal filings, your criminal complaints, um, that, that, and, and, and the legal action that you take being met by the courts. I mean, this is where we also run into to a rule of law issue. Do you find that, that the courts um, are processing these in a manner that you find is timely and fair? Or I just, I mean, I want to let everybody have a chance, but I just want to set the stage a bit for, with this question. Thanks. Yes, uh, we, we have now, we are not yet in front of the courts. We are in front of administrative authorities. Okay. So it's a basically, it's a basically administrative, still, still administrative procedures in front of, as I said, city of Zrenjanin, autonomous mm -hmm. province of Vojvodina and ministry uh, for environment and for construction, depending on procedure, which are a second instance uh, uh, authority. So far, so far, uh, Unfortunately, the state does not protect rule of law in this case. They are protecting foreign investor against public interest because it's, it's, it is that simple. In this case, we have a public interest for, from other one side and we have a interest of, of a foreign investor on the other side. So, so far, the state took the stand of this other party, unfortunately. Thank you so much. I want to come back and, and talk a bit more about how you build the cases, how you build the strategy and build public support. But I will turn to, to Denis Zisko from the Center for Ecology and Energy in Bosnia. Uh, Denis, in the pre-COVID era, uh, we spent some time together in Tuzla. We saw some of the environmental degradation and, and devastation around one of these uh, big uh, power plants and, and, and looked at some of the potential problems uh, with a, with a planned uh, Chinese investment going ahead. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, give us an update on, on what the situation is now in Tuzla? How is the air pollution um, and how are your legal challenges um, and, and, and activism uh, being received I in Tuzla by the Federation and by the state level authorities? Thanks. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. First, I'm sorry not to be there. I was actually, I had my bags packed and then unfortunately I got my uh, results of the test on COVID and now you're talking to a person which is COVID positive, so be aware of that. <laughs> I have the coronavirus. But anyway, uh, I'm feeling good, so it's okay. So, uh, coming back to the story about Tuzla 7, unfortunately, uh, the actual preparatory works for the construction of Tuzla 7 have been completed by now. And we could expect the Chinese workers to come to the construction site somewhere in spring of next year. That's probably also due to Corona crisis. Uh, the, the thing is, if you are talking about the air pollution, uh, if I would turn the camera through the window here, you wouldn't see much because today we, we got the temperature inversion, so the smog is just 
uh, well, you can say that it continu it's continuing to kill, it, kill us, and it will continue uh, to do it for, for, well, you can say decades to come, because nothing has been done to improve the situation uh, related to, to air pollution prevention measures for, well, since we've been talking about that, and we've been talking about that for quite some time. If we talk about the uh, following with what, what Jovan said, if we talk about the, the legal proceedings and, and, and stuff we have done in the past related to environmental permits and cross-border problems and, and, and uh, complaints to the Aarhus Convention and to the ESPO Convention and recently to, to uh, UN Human Rights Department, Unfortunately, the whole process is going quite slow, <clears throat> so it's not really uh, uh, preventing the stuff to happen here on the ground. And when we talk about the local courts, we have initiated several court cases against the environmental permits, uh, which have been, let's say, on the cantonal level of the courts for three to four years, and then they have uh, uh, made the judgment and now we are complaining to the higher court. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that uh, we assume that until we get the final uh, judgment from the high court, the actual permit will expire because the permits last for five years. So uh, that's the trend we see uh, with the local courts now and with the authorities. It seems that they're very happy sort of to stop the complaint process by going to court because they know that the court will prolong the whole decision making for a very long time and we will never get the, the actual judgment. And in the meantime, as I said, the, the, the environmental permits will expire and then we'll have to restart the whole cycle. So unfortunately, the local courts or the tactics to, to try to improve something through the local courts has proven to be, uh, well, not successful. Uh, uh, and it has become a delaying tactics of the authorities because unfortunately we live in a very corrupt country where uh, the whole system is linked uh, with the, I call them ruling parties because they're basically ruling us, they're not governing as they should, they're more behaving as rulers than as, as, as governments because we elected them to govern on our behalf, not to rule with us. Unfortunately, I think it was a misinterpretation of translation of, of the governance where it was translated in our language as Vladavina or Vlada. And I think they got the idea that they're supposed to Vladati with us, rule with our lives. But that's another topic. So I don't know if I answered your question for the time being, that's it, I mean, yeah. Well, we can come. We can come back. I want. I do want to talk a bit more about how uh, you know some of the some of the people that we met in Tuzla are reacting, organizing, um, and fighting against this. But but maybe we can uh, turn to Jovana now. Um, um, not to insert myself too much in all these stories, but I was also in your very beautiful country uh, writing a story not so long ago about um, the fact that this uh, Chinese-built highway uh, had sent be in the before COVID once again. Uh, the the public debt to above 80 uh, percent that that the expenses were continuing to go up um, and and I'm wondering now you know as as your country confronts a big public health crisis I mean how what are the consequences of of this decision on, on the citizens and on, and on ordinary people and 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 what are you doing and what can you do now after the deal has already been done um, to try to ameliorate the situation Thank you, Valerie. Um, hello, everyone. I also was packing my you know, stuff to go to Sofia, but I'm still here in Montenegro. It is a beautiful country, but for, for, for change, it, it will be better to be somewhere abroad. Uh, but still, um, when it comes to Chinese influence in Montenegro, it's all about the highways they already set. 
uh, and uh, it is about you know public debt which was around 80 percent but which is now projected by the uh, world bank to be around 93 percent by the end of the year and that's something which is a um, uh, main task of the new government which will hopefully be be established by the end of the year and that's just you know like first level of, of impact of the chinese uh, investments in in montenegro the one which is connected with with the budget and that's something we we conducted the public opinion poll in in march uh, by political network and the question was for, to the citizens what is your opinion about the highway and around 70 percent of, of the citizens said that they are fine with the highway and that the montenegro will benefit uh, from this project and from the highway, but actually just 40% were sure that uh, this uh, project is stable and that we will be able actually to pay in loan and, and to, to be like stable country when it comes to, to, to finance. And the, the, the thing about the, uh, the highway and the public debt is uh, actually that the contract with the Chinese are not, uh, is not public at the moment. And we are hoping that the new government will actually publish the contract by the end of the year or at the beginning of the, of the next year. We are hoping for that, but uh, um, as you know, the, 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 the policy of the, of the government in China is actually to restrict the, 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 the uh, oversight over their businesses and everything. So I am not sure what is there in the in the co contract and whether our uh, new government will be able actually to publish it. And somehow it is really important to have this transparency in in uh, in cooperation and with uh, Chinese investment because that will be like we real clear guideline to to the uh, other western balkan countries how to set conditions and actually uh, how to actually mitigate the risks of, uh, with these um, uh, let's say conditions posed by by the uh, Chi chinese and by the by the companies from from china and our government was unable actually uh, to negotiate well that the highway and as you said what is the impact on the real life of citizens in montenegro the first one is on the budget and their quality of life because of this huge public debt and and uh, uh, decline in uh, real gdp the next one is actually that the their human rights are restricted because of you know they have right to know what is there and how uh, how our government actually is uh, um, implementing such a uh, contract and such a huge project in, in the country and our government is calling it as the project of the century and the rest uh, is uh, actually calling it as the highway to nowhere and then the third impact, the third level level of impact is on environment because you know there is a devastation of the of the Tara River, which is the, on the UNESCO Heritage World List, and uh, there are lots of you know protests by the local civil society and uh, lots of uh, criminal charges, but without any kind of developments and progress. And as I said, the restriction on the human rights, the, this is really connected with uh, freedom of, uh, of ac uh, uh, free access to information. And I will list later what else is not public when it comes to, to, to Chinese investment. And as it was already said during the first panel, uh, this whole situation is actually influencing the rule of law and democracy in our countries, which is really at the low level at the moment. And this is something which is really beneficial for for china and for for their influence in the region so this this is for 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 the beginning i hope that i will have a chance to elaborate more on on this absolutely you certainly will thank you um and and it is a sh pity that uh, that none of you could come i must say the hotel is very nice so hopefully um in the post covid era we will all be able to meet here together um uh, Danilo, uh, the Share Foundation uh, deals with, among other things, um, surveillance cameras that are being put up in Belgrade. I think every day I'm getting all sorts of Twitter notifications about pictures of, of new cameras that, that your organization is spotting across the city and across Serbia. Um, and these cameras are, are generally being put up without so much public information about what happens to the data gathered. Um, what what is your organization, what is the SHARE Foundation doing to monitor this and, and, and how are you building a coalition to get people uh, who are worried and frustrated about this to, to try to encourage the government to be more transparent? 
Uh, yes, uh, th thank you for that question. Uh, just two minutes ago, I was updating our table of cameras in Belgrade, and uh, we reached the number of 1,001 uh, camera in Belgrade at the moment, uh, uh, on more than uh, 450 locations. So uh, when our Minister of Police said uh, almost uh, 20 months ago that Belgrade will be covered with thousands of cameras, we didn't believe it, you know. But uh, after after 20 months of implementation, this is now the reality. And yes, we, we do have the whole city covered uh, with these cameras. And what is the problem is this is uh, these are smart cameras with facial recognition software, so uh, this is making possible for our authorities, our police, to monitor everybody at every time in, in the city of Belgrade. And uh, when this all started, uh, basically our government and our minister of police basically bragged with this technology. They said that they bought this phenomenal technology from, from chi Chinese China uh, from Huawei, and that they will be able to monitor everybody at the, at the whole time. So, uh, our main action was to raise awareness of these questions. So, so that that we explain to the citizens and to uh, the government that this is something problematic. And we started with, um, of course, first of all, FOIA requests, freedom of information requests, and I have to say. Police denied all of our requests uh, for public information, so we don't know how much uh, this uh, technology costs, uh, what are technical specification, and all other things. And uh, what we did, we start researching on our own. So majority of information we managed to find on the official site of Huawei because they are a vendor that is actually selling this technology, so they want public to know what they are selling and how much it costs. But we also started uh, uh, to gather community around this issue. And uh, yes, we did map uh, thousands of cameras in Belgrade, but this was done with the uh, help of the citizens. So from every, every part of the town, people were walking and making photos of cameras, sending us so we could publish them and put it in on the map. So yes, now we have, I don't know, community of uh, dozens of organizations, hundreds of citizens that are interested uh, in this topic. We There are now um, art groups making performances about this issue. So we managed to put this uh, issue into the public discourse. We also uh, tried the, let's say, legal ways. So what we fought from the beginning is this data protection impact assessment that our police must do in accordance with, with data protection law. And uh, I have to say, police already did two of these impact assessments. And uh, for the second time, our data protection commissioner uh, said that this is not sufficient document for the use of uh, uh, smart uh, surveillance and biometric surveillance. So even though we are living in the countries with the low level of, of rule of law, I agree with that. but. Uh, if we are if we are pushing some of these uh, instruments, legal instruments, sometimes you can uh, gain gain something. So I, I'm not sure where this is going. Uh, this is this is a multi-million dollar uh, agreement. So we already bought this technology, uh, but what our stand is that this is actually not legal to implement such technology. We already have many cities in the U.S. that ban this type of technology in public spaces, but also uh, there are debates all around the Europe. And uh, this Thursday, we are launching a campaign, a uh, petition for banning uh, uh, biometric surveillance. This is done uh, in, a, in coordination with the organization from Brussels, Italy, uh, Germany, Netherlands, UK. So these are also countries that have similar issues. And uh, yes, we, we will try to fight on all battlefields, uh, international, domestic, to, to stop the implementation of, of this project, Safe City project uh, that's, that is actually made by uh, uh, China vendor Huawei. And I have to say one more thing. This is uh, uh, yes geopolitical question, but uh, I was asked many times, are we more concerned that this is uh, 
technology coming from China. Uh, and I have to say that uh, uh, we are more afraid the, of our government than China government. So this would be uh, American technology uh, or European technology or even our, our own. So uh, our stand is that technology cannot say, solve issues that are deeper. So if we have a country with low level of uh, rule of law, uh, when you have this type of invasive technology, we could have many, many problems. So I mean, maybe I'll stop here and uh, um, leaves uh, uh, for discussion much more. I just yes. actually want to ask two follow-up questions before I, okay. I come back around to the beginning of the pool. And the first one is, um, do you have evidence that, that any of the facial recognition cameras or the images that have been taken from them are being used regularly in um, criminal proceedings? Or have, you know, has there, have they been disproved decisive yet in any court case? Uh, no, uh, actually, police is claiming that they are still not using this, this technology, and this would be illegal because data protection commissioner didn't uh, give them right to do this. But uh, they bought this technology. This is super expensive technology. It costs millions of dollars. So I'm pretty sure they are going to use this. And do do you know then how soon it could happen that uh, that the uh, I mean. I don't know that. In accordance with the documents, they, we saw they said this implementation of this project is going to take at least three to four years. So, at which moment they are going to start to use this technology, I'm not. I'm not aware. Yeah. And and the second question. Sorry to abuse you while you're on the spot here. No is that. Uh, Jovana spoke about the potential for increased transparency with some of these contracts now that there's a new government. Uh, in Serbia, you also have a new government, but the situation is a little bit different. I mean, I was watching um, over the last few years that sometimes members of the opposition in parliament would come forward with explosive information, or I presume that... that, that uh, Parliamentarians are entitled to, to make requests for information in a way that, that ordinary citizens maybe can't always. Do you see or do you fear that, that uh, the new, with the new government uh, and the new parliament, with, only, uh, with so few members of the opposition, uh, that, that, that there might be a, even a more decreased access to information? Or do you think it will be more or less the same? Well, I mean, I believe it's pretty much the same. I mean, we don't have basically opposition in the parliament. And yeah, we are we, we are fighting this uh, information for two years now. There is a complaint in front of the commissioner for uh, freedom of information. And we are asking for this information. They are claiming they cannot give us. But we're, we're going to continue this legal fight for this information. But I have to say, other than... Uh, other than the price, which is super important, uh, in this case, we managed to gain a lot of information, as I said, from the uh, Huawei website. So we know now a lot about this, this technology. So if the government doesn't give this information, we have to find some other way. And, but it doesn't mean we, we are not going to continue fighting for this info, because I think this is super important to know how much this costs. This is for sure dozens of uh, of millions of euros or dollars or something. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to say that I don't intend to monopolize uh, my role as the, moder as the moderator the whole time. So I do want to tell people that if you do have questions, I don't know what's best if you want to send them in the chat or if you want to raise your hand. Um, I will be, will be looking here at the computer screen to, to see who has a raised hand. Um, but maybe we come back to Jovan and I want to ask, you know, you are pursuing um, this legal activism and, and fighting against this through the courts, but but do you also find that that it's been and, and I guess I will pose this also to Dennis as well. How is it also trying to build um, a, a public consensus and support and a campaign for for what you're doing? I mean, um, these issues of, of 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 land zoning rights maybe don't affect everybody, but the quality of the air that we can see, you know, quite often many capitals in the region are are in the top ten lists uh, of poor poor air quality. You know, topping uh, Dhaka or Mumbai or something, which is kind of crazy that it's Skopje with its 600,000 inhabitants has worse air than, than Mumbai. Um, but so, so these are issues that actually affect everyone. And I wonder, uh, do you see that, 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 that many citizens see it that way? Or what are some of the challenges you face in trying to, to build a more a broader consensus and support uh, for, for what you're trying to achieve? Jovan. Yeah, 
uh, I think that actually in the past two or three years, maybe in Serbia and I think in the entire Western Balkans region, uh, this uh, uh, concern from the citizens is is raised on a, on a higher level. And I, I think there is improvement here uh, that the people are uh, uh, aware of this uh, of this huge problem because uh, we are all breathing the same air. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a slow process. Uh, it's a, not, it is not going as fast as we all would like. But uh, yes, I can see I can see improvement. And this is important because of. Uh, of uh, uh, this will make our job easier, of course. But uh, where I see the biggest problem here is that uh, people are uh, not, uh, 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 they're not still uh, available to identify uh, reasons for this problem. So uh, uh, many, many of the people, most of the people are aware, yes, we have a problem with the air. It's polluted. We can see it when we go up, but uh, not enough of them are asking questions to themselves. Why is this the case? So this is where we all should work with the people to explain them. And it's not easy uh, in the countries uh, like uh, countries in Western Balkans, where is. Uh, two major problems, uh, uh, lack of information and lack of law implementation. So uh, these countries uh, with, with these two problems I, is, um, uh, I would say, ideal strategic partner for uh, suspicious investments and disputable investments like those you mentioned uh, uh, from China. So uh, our government uh, doesn't ask many questions and uh, doesn't re react uh, when the polluters uh, make uh, 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 law breaches. So, so uh, in order to save uh, social peace, social order, in order to save uh, jobs for the people, uh, they're practically uh very much quiet when it comes to ecological standards so uh they are trying in this way they are trying also to keep the citizens calm and not to uh, actually inform them about the reasons as i said why the air is polluted and they don't want to turn the rage of the people against those investors because this would mean that they would uh, turn the rage to themselves actually because they are practically arranging these uh, these uh, uh, transactions with the strategic partners just uh, just to, to to clarify here uh, earlier this year in the beginning of 2020 serbia uh, adopted the new law on infrastructural projects, which was uh, not so covered in the medias, even independent medias. But it's a very problematic law on uh, on uh, traffic uh, infrastructure, which practically allowed the government to choose strategic partners directly, without public procurements, without competition uh, and uh, commercial uh, rules. Uh, must be fulfilled. They are practically allowed to, to, to choose the partners for infrastructural projects as, uh, as they wish, or they are also entitled to, to, to give the order to some uh, uh, sub body of the government uh, uh, or uh, uh, other, other, other uh, 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 ruling uh, authority to choose these these partners even on the local level so so this was a huge problem and a huge uh, step back uh, for for um, uh, transparency for the uh, rules of, of public procurement and everything else so this is another this is another i would say uh, uh, problem that we will face uh, in the future uh, and uh, and uh, as I said, one more step back. 
And just to, just as a quick follow on onto that, I mean, many of you are representing countries where the public broadcaster and much of the larger media outlets are are quite um, uh, in, have, have to put it in, in favor of the government. Shall we say? I mean, what is you, you know what are some of the successful uh, strategies that you have found or to get the broadest access to the, to the public to to sway their opinion in a place where there is such a small kind of independent media? To be honest, I don't have the answer to your question yet. We are trying very hard to, to, to uh, explain, as I said, uh, to explain this is a broader question. It's not a political question. It's a question for all of us. So far, we have access to, to independent media, to television, to newspaper. But as, as you know, of course, in Serbia, uh, you can't reach uh, the mainstream medias, uh, national frequency medias, uh, because this is not a popular thing to, to, to be said. Uh, Rare started campaign last Friday uh, re related to, to, to clean air uh, in Belgrade, and uh, we, we uh, lease uh, billboards uh, in uh, four locations in Belgrade. And we, and we even have a problem with this to find the agency who is uh, ready to rent us a place for billboards be because it is, a, I, I admit, it's a provocative campaign. It says uh, on the billboard, uh, the, the air pollution kills us, who order killings. So, uh, but we didn't uh, put our finger to anybody. We just asked general question, who is responsible? This is, this is the whole sense for this. And uh, uh, as I said, we had a problem with the agencies. Unfortunately, uh, fortunately we, we find the one who wanted to, to work with us, but there was, a, there was a problem. Wow, thank you very much. Dennis, uh, yeah. I would like to ask you a similar question. How are you, you know, I, I, there are so many people ar around the area of, uh, of uh, uh, the, new, the power plant that are, that you know can speak about the damage that they've had to their to their food to their air to their lungs but how do you transpose that into to broader activism over the issue yeah well as you know i i'm in this uh business <laughs> for for quite some time now basically when we started uh, almost a decade ago the this uh, uh, uh fight against coal basically it's fight against coal uh, and we started that in the coal mining area. We were immediately considered and, 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 and treated as enemies of the state, as, as enemies of the coal miners, as you all know the narrative, so there is no need for me to repeat that. Well, after a while, uh, through coming out with facts, because that's the only way you can actually try to attract uh, 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 wider support for whatever you do, <clears throat> coming out with the facts about the health issues, because we tried with money, we tried with corruption, we tried with many, 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 many approaches to the campaign. The best actual tool we had is when we tackled the issue of health. So that's when we started uh, to get more support for our activities. So basically, if you compare the reactions to a statement that coal kills now, compared to that same statement 10 years ago, it's, it's a completely different, different reaction from the general population. So that's the approach that worked for us. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that that's the recipe that can work everywhere else, but here it worked. Of course, initially we were targeting the big coal power plant we have, which is using the technology of 40, 50 years old technology. And there we had, uh, uh, a huge negative response from the general population because once again the authorities using the media were saying that we are trying to jeopardize their jobs and and jeopardize the the most profitable uh, economic sector in in the country we are foreign spies as i said the usual narrative but even though they were attacking us for were well, blaming us for this in the meantime, the general population actually got and, and understood the problem of coal. And that was actually the message we wanted to give. 
that burning coal kills, even though they were blaming the households, uh, the household heating and everything else, it worked. So now when you're talking about air pollution, everyone is talking about the cause, which is burning coal. So it took us 10 years, but we got there. And of course, now there is a pressure from the general population on the authorities to tackle the issue of burning of coal in the household uh, sector, which is contributing quite a lot. But also there is an improved support to the stuff we are talking about against the coal power plant. Well, during this process, of course, the authorities and Electroprida, which is leading this project of Tuzla 7, sort of used or misused our narrative, stating that they are going to uh, uh, deal with the problem of coal pollution by building a new and modern block, which will replace the old polluting blocks. There we come to the problem of uh, ash disposal and the actual uh, health health risks and health issues caused by ash disposal. At this point, we are still not uh, as far as we got in the air pollution issues uh, uh, in building this, this negative uh, uh, approach of the general population about the, the health problems caused by ash pollution. It's, it's more concentrated, it's more difficult to, to explain the consequences of the ash disposal the way it's done here in Tuzla, uh, the, the negative health impacts, not just on the population living just in the vicinity of, of, of the ash disposal site, but, but also wider, be it through underground water pollution or by just dust being picked up from the ash disposal site and blown into the center of town. There are some positive movements there also. And uh, coming back to the media, Fortunately, uh, well, after lots of efforts, we finally managed to attract also the attention of the media to that problem. I mean, you remember you were here. So, <laughs> uh, so we have reactions and now we even have the, the let's call them state-owned media addressing that problem. Very shy. But still, they, 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 they saw that it's something that they cannot completely ignore. And the thing that we managed in, in last, well, now we, we have elections, local elections in 15 days, basically. We managed to push this question of ash disposal into the narrative of the pre-election campaign of certain political parties. So, uh, the answer is, you have to be patient. It's not going to happen overnight. Well, the good thing is that we are very young and enthusiastic. So it will take some time, but we'll get there. And anyway, I think, yeah, that's it for now. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jovana, I wanted to ask you, uh, we saw quite a lot of public polling um, in the wake of the COVID crisis, um, kind of narrative shifting in Serbia about uh, how many people in Serbia see China as one of the biggest allies, one of the biggest donors, um, and one of the biggest helpers. Uh, I saw also recently that, that, that Montenegro has, has done their statistics such that, uh, including the debts, um, China is also the biggest investor, is now the biggest investor in Montenegro, right? But I wonder, uh, you just, you mentioned this public opinion polling that you did, and I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about the way that, that uh, Montenegrin citizens per perceive China and the, and the influence um, that, that they are increasingly having in the region, and, and, and maybe, tell us if it's if it's different from from the general public in Serbia thanks well it is definitely uh, different because the uh, the Chinese like let, let's say support during the COVID was rather like you know symbolic it wasn't that big as it was in in um, in Serbia and our government was trying you know to push for the narrative that the EU was the main donor and the EU is the main partner and you know they had actually public statement for, for each the nations but as I said the, the Chinese support was rather similar 
similar. But as we said, the, for the first time now, the, uh, China is listed as the major uh, foreign investor in the country, and uh, these uh, investments are around 70 million uh, euro uh, for the first eight months of the, of the, of the year. And actually, the central bank is um, declared such information to be confidential. So basically, everything which is connected with the, uh, with the Chinese investments in China in the country is actually internal. It is not, you know, the public does not have access to such information. So that's the first thing about the investments during the, the last year. And it, it, it's really like a surprise that the China wasn't listed in, uh, within the major investors during the previous years. And also it's not about just about the contract with the China road and bridge company. It's about, uh, you know, they are not obliged to pay many taxes uh, according to the contract. And so, so far we don't have like clear information about the amount of the money which they are not obliged to pay on annual basis. And also the China Road, uh, road and bridge company is preparing on, on month, monthly basis uh, like reports on local complaints around the, the Tara River, but they are not publishing such such information. Uh, such information. So we are not even obliged to see what local uh, uh, citizens there are complaining about uh, when when it comes to construction of, of the highway. So this is every, the all information about the the the, uh, the investments are, are coming from China are not public in Montenegro. And when it comes to you know like feeling of citizens and how they feel about uh, everything as i said that they are fine with the highway but that that was because of the government's policy and during the summer you know the with all of these issues and all of these problems with public debt and everything they signed a new contract with chinese company to be to build a uh, power plant in the north which is worth 54 million uh, euro so basically they were not ready for this switch of the government and they really see a uh, china is a credible partner with all this secrecy and, and, and everything. So when, when it comes to citizens, as I said, they see uh, benefits uh, from the construction of the highway, but we will see what will be the, the, the you know, attitude after, this, uh, after the change of the government. Thank you so much. Um, Danilo, can you talk about you know, the nature of the interactive component of having people uh, submit photos that they see? Um, do you, I mean, I'm presumably people are submitting photos of the same place, but do you have uh, data on, on how many different people have submitted these photos? And do you think that, that giving people a role to play has, has increased their kind of stakeholder status in what you're trying to accomplish? Well, yes, that was definitely our idea to include citizens because uh, we are digital rights organizations. So usually it's very difficult to engage citizens when we are talking about, I don't know, data on the Internet or, I don't know, uh, rights uh, for freedom of expression online and so on and so on. But uh, this, this situation had specific component. Yes, we are talking about uh, super advanced technology, but uh, our citizens could see the maps on their streets. So this was really bothersome for them because when they are on the computers and leaving some data, this, they cannot comprehend why this can be problematic if somebody else is having access to their data. But uh, living in a, a let's say, post-socialist society, when they see the camera and they know that the police has access to these cameras, then they see something problematic and this is let's say the we had the biggest success with the citizens with this with this initiative and um we are now preparing for uh, for this campaign that I, that I told you about about the petition and uh, i think there are more than uh, than uh, hundreds of people who send us some uh, photos or or some comments so this is i mean this is uh, and other than that, we also included like, I don't know, our, uh, more than hundreds of people who are our associates who tried to, uh, who know this issue and are, are included ever so. But this is like hundreds of new citizens, you know, that we don't know about sending their photos or saying that they think that there is going to be cameras in their neighborhood and they're concerned. So I'm really hoping that with uh, this campaign, with this petition, 
will be able to engage much more people because now finally we have uh, uh, some reach and yeah you know, let's see what, what happens on Thursday and, and in the weeks in the weeks to come. Well, that was what I was just going to ask. I wanted to, to move a little bit more to, to talk about cross-border cooperation. Am I muted? It says no. Um, <laughs> sorry, the screen over here said I was. Um, you know, when you are, are working with all these international partners, can you just elaborate a little bit on, on, on what you see as some of the main differences between those countries and, and Serbia? And then I want to ask Jovan as well a bit about uh, cross-border cooperation. Yeah, well, I have to say we are cooperating most with the uh, organization from European Union and uh, uh, usually the narrative is that we have much more problems here because the of rule of law and, and stuff like that. But in this uh, particular issue, when we are talking about uh, bi biometric mass surveillance, I have to say we have quite similar issues and quite similar problems because, uh, I don't know, uh, even the oldest democracies uh, fail when uh, to pass the test when they got like this super uh, advanced technology for surveilling people you know uh, us britain you know cases in germany uh, and belgium so i have to say that uh, it's definitely trend for governments all around the world to to try to get as much as data and to use technology you know to, uh, to to get to gain power so i have to say that we are at, at the moment uh, we have quite similar issues uh, regarding what government wants to do with the technology of course uh, definitely transparency is at the higher level in the western countries so there are much more information on, on procurement of this technology and much more information is accessible to the citizen and organization but i think that uh, this is uh, this is pro problem for i would say the world how, how what is our stance what societies we want to live in and yeah this is my opinion is this is going to be the issue in decades to come how, how our government are going to decide uh, that they will be using this technology because uh, we already have societies like China or some other countries in the East that uh, use this te these technologies in a way that is uh, absolutely not accessible by my standards. But there are some other gains they, they have there. When we are talking about petty crimes, they're basically crimeless societies, you know. So I, I, I just think that it is going to be... Uh, uh, it is going to be really difficult, you know, when you have like this, you know, impacts from East and from the West to, you know, fight for these causes. Thank you so much. Um, Jovan, I, I want to ask you as well about cross-border cooperation and maybe especially with, with EU countries. I mean, uh, Bor, Smederevo and Zrenjanin will all have an impact on Bulgaria, on Romania, on Hungary. And I wonder, do you have you established any ties to organizations in any of those countries um, to to kind of work on, on talking about what the consequences can be, what the effects could be of some of these um, the polluting investments? And, and what kind of support are you getting then also for, I mean, these are all EU member countries, what kind of support are you getting from the European Union and from the, yeah, on the topic, thanks. Yeah, yes, uh, our partners and our donors are mostly from the, from the EU because we are, uh, as an organization, we, are, we have this general rule from the beginning of, of our work that uh, we are not participating in the projects financed by the state of Serbia. So all of our partners and, and, and the donors are, are, as I said, from abroad and, and mostly, of course, from the, from the EU. But uh, uh, first about them, uh, they are not very surprised with the situation here because it's pretty much similar or, or even the same uh, in Serbia, in Bosnia, and they also saw it even in some of EU countries like uh, Bulgaria or, or Poland. There is, uh, there is, uh, uh, it is very similar situation, but uh, controlling mechanisms are uh, uh, maybe better in these uh, EU countries. 
because of the EU, not because of the uh, state's tools and uh, 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 legal tools. Uh, to be honest, uh, I'm not quite satisfied uh, with the, uh, the cooperation uh, between the organizations uh, in, in these aspects. As you said, it's a cross-border issue, but, but I don't see that organizations are connected uh, well enough uh, to to uh, and they're uh, that they're working as they should work on these issues uh, uh, unlike the governments uh, uh, of these states uh, I think that we should all learn from our governments how they are uh, connected well connected and how they are uh, uh, watching each other backs in, in in these situations and they really strongly and honestly supporting each other in uh, manip manipulating with their own citizens. So, so um, I think these, uh, these all systems are um, staying uh, at the, 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 the uh, and ruling the states. As Danny says, this is precisely good expression, ruling with us. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a way they they do it because they are manipulating with the information and they are sharing this information and use it for for do their work. I would just say here about we were talking about Chinese investments and one example uh, 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 for Serbia. We have information uh, uh, every two weeks or three weeks or, or every two days from our. Uh, highest representatives of our government. I saw the statement of the prime minister a uh, few few weeks ago that the investments from China are about 10 billions of euros uh, in the past 10 years uh, in Serbia, which is not true because because the investments are approximately slightly above 1.5 billion. But how did they calculate this amount? They practically uh, 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 take into consideration greenfield investments and loans that we take from China. So uh, they practically uh, report the loan that we took for infrastructural projects as the investment. And this is used how to manipulate with the citizens to create our conscience to be like, OK, maybe we have a slight problem with the air pollution. Maybe we have a problem with rule of law, with democracy, with transparency and everything else. But what do we get? We get tens of billions of euros of investments. We get uh, jobs for our people. We get uh, uh, huge uh, uh, investment interest for further development of, of investments in our economy. And this is the narrative in the entire region. This is what the government wants to create in the region. And as I said, I would like that the civil sector uh, is also well connected, at least close to this, uh, as it's the case with the governments. Wow, what an exhortation um, for for regional cooperation on a on a civil society level, as as good as governments. We are actually already approaching the end of the panel. I don't. I, I just want to ask if anybody had any final remarks or anything that they else that they really wanted to address before I turn it over to Vesela, who actually can make some some concluding remarks about the panel. Um, yeah, if, I, if I may add something? Yes, please, please, please. Yeah, okay. No, the thing is that uh, while listening to the first panel and you know, my colleagues now, I think we are focusing too much on the influence of China. The thing is that all of these decisions are made by our governments. So we have to stop blaming others for the mistakes done in our countries. It is our governments that have invested, they in, in invited China to come and, and give loans and everything else. So we have to start cleaning our own backyard first and stop blaming the others because that's basically the narrative we have sort of taken from the authorities. In their narrative, it's always the others to be blamed for something. No, 
we are here to make the decisions. It's, it's our authorities and our governments which are making these decisions. It's not China, it's not the States or Russia or whoever. Our governments are making the decisions. And of course, on top of that, you have the problem of EU, because we all claim, I mean, our authorities, and we claim that we want to join EU as, as soon as possible. And there is the role of EU. And EU is unfortunately, I repeat that quite often, I mean, it, it's first of all very confused because they have no idea what, how to deal with the Balkans and, and, and Southeast Europe. And the, the other term I use, they're very impotent because they're constantly saying it's up to your authorities, which is right. It's up to your authorities to make the decisions. But then in the meantime, they sort of provide the infusion to keep the status quo for the last 25 years, at least in our country after the war. So there are millions and millions of euros coming as grants to build the capacities of the Balkan countries, which is basically used to keep the status quo because that sort of makes Europe happy because they have no idea how to deal with us. So at least they keep us, we are not fighting against each other. There is no war, so it's okay. So first we have to start dealing with the problems here and then continue to blame others for whatever is happening. And with that, sorry, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Giovanna. I was going to say I always found the same thing. Nobody, I mean, the Chinese didn't force the Montenegrins to accept that contract. They accepted it. Please, uh, go ahead. Yes, I also wanted to say yes, the, our governments are, you know, main reason why we have such uh, state of the rule of law in the country and state of democracy and everything. And they are also the responsibility are on them because of the, the damaging contracts and everything. But as, as I said, the, the part of the broader uh, policy of Chinese government is to have this secrecy and to have like, you know, and uh, as I said, it, it is not uh, known whether will we have uh, now when there is a change of the government chance to see what is there if there are articles in the contract which are you know like uh, keeping the, the data and keeping the negotiating positions uh, you know like uh, uh, confidential so uh, I wanted also to say that uh, actually uh, there is a lack of capacity within the civil society to deal with uh, China and to deal with actually construction and investments and everything just two of, of NGOs are dealing with the Chinese investments and, and interests in, in the country and two of them uh, are monitoring the, the implementation of the contract and the um, not of the contract, but the construction of the highway in the country. I see now room for inter interventions and for impact when we have like new government after 30 years, but there is still a need for networking, the regional networking, because, you know, uh, we are not, uh, as I said, there is a lack of capacity. We, we don't have enough knowledge about, you know, uh, how China is operating and what is there within the contract and what are the, the, the co conditions. And we, we we have to deal together and to, to, to work together to improve conditions for such investments. Thanks, Giovanna. Uh, Danilo, I don't want to deprive you of the chance to make a, a concluding remark now that everybody else has, but... Uh... I mean, I can, I can only agree. I already said this, I mean, when, we're, when I was talking about this intrusive technology, I mean, o almost all, we had more than 100 media appearances, like 40, uh, out of Serbia, and every journalist asks us, are you afraid that this is uh, a technology from China? And to which of them I, I told what I said before is that we are much more afraid of our own government and our own, you know, politicians than, than some technology from China or their, I don't know, secret service or stuff like that. So yes, I, I completely agree with Denis and Yolanda in this regard. Thank you so much. And yet, we see year after year that so few people want to actually, young people want to actually get into politics and, and change this. They just, there's, but we can have a whole nother panel about about that, I think. Um, I would like to ask Vesela to, to give a few summary remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope this is on. Mm. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Oh, that's great. Um, Thanks a lot, uh, Val, for moderating this. This was a great panel. I will try maybe to summarize both panels uh, from today uh, and agree actually with what Dennis just said towards the end, 
that China is a lens through which we see our own deficiencies. Uh, and this is why we chose this topic, because we thought it, is, it has also, it has so many cross-cutting implications from security to environment, from, uh, you know, media through infrastructure. And um, uh, it demonstrates actually that we do have a rule of law issue, uh, an issue of the quality of democracy uh, that also allows others to uh, to play in 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 the field uh, that we need to be better with our environment uh, to try to enforce standards and green measures. Obviously, that the EU should help countries to cope with foreign influence and with Chinese influence in this case. As Jovana said, it's an unknown place. It's a it's a tactic that we. Uh, that we're not familiar with. Uh, and also, as, as uh, Zoran and others said in the previous session, we do need capacity uh, to cope with this. Um, I am very tempted by this paradox about m money fueling stability or stabilocracy or whatever you call it, and as a cure asking for more money, um, which came out a bit from the previous panel. Um, so I don't know where exactly the balance is. I guess uh, the answer to a lot of this, uh, and here I want to thank Alexandra for pushing us to do the civil society panel, because I think the answer to all of this uh, in many respects is really uh, the answer that civil society and civic organizations can give, because they're the real um, criterion for uh, what is a public interest? And this is something that our politicians uh, often forget. Uh, with that, I really hope that we can enhance our cooperation cross-border and cross-regional um, in the months and years to come. I really hope that we will be able to do this next time in person. And in the meantime, uh, stay, health, stay healthy and all of you who feel um, who are who are positive, <laughs> uh, uh, treat it in a positive way. Uh, so hopefully it gets away uh, quicker. On behalf of uh, Marco and myself, uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for this panel and for this discussion and for being part of this. Uh, and goodbye. Thanks very much. Dennis, get well, get well soon. I'm well. I don't have a problem. With well, don't COVID. get sick then. <laughs> okay, I'll do my best. <laughs> okay, Thanks. ciao. See you somewhere. Ciao.